let us start with the peace chant <clears throat> om bhadram karne bhi shrinuyama deva bhadram pashye maksha bhirya jatra sthirai rangai stushtvagam sastano bhi vyashe ma deva hitai yadayo Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Starksho Arishta Nemi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 So we were doing the third chapter of the Mandukya Karika and now we are on verse number 33. We are going to start verse number 33. Isn't that so? Yes. Verse 33. Please chant with me. Akalpakam ajam jnanam Akalpakam ajam jnanam Geya bhinnam prachakshate Geya bhinnam prachakshate Brahma geyam ajam nityam Brahma geyam ajam nityam Ajena jam vibudhyate Ajena jam vibudhyate Very grand verse. It says that unborn consciousness which is beyond all imagination, where all imaginations come to an end. The knowledge by which you realize this is not different from the thing which you realize. That Brahman which is to be realized is an unborn consciousness, an undying eternal. The unborn realizes the unborn by the unborn. So, all right, so what does it mean? Throughout this chapter, Gaurapada has been telling us that the ultimate reality, Brahman, is not a cause, not an effect. Not an effect means, it's not that Brahman has actually become this world that we studied throughout this chapter. It did not actually produce a second thing apart from itself. So, when, is, when do you say that an effect has been produced? When another thing has been produced? When something has happened, but nothing has happened. So, Brahman does not actually produce an effect, does not actually produce this world. And if it does not actually produce this world, then we cannot say it's a cause. With me so far? That's the whole argument in the third chapter till now. What's the point of this? Because there is no real cause nor real effect. Brahman, the ultimate reality is beyond cause and effect, therefore non-dual. This chapter is called the chapter on non-duality, that there is no, non-duality means there is no second reality apart from Brahman. There is no second reality apart from Brahman. There could be a second reality apart from Brahman if Brahman actually produced a second thing. But Brahman has not produced a second thing called the world. The world still appears. That means the world which appears is not a second reality apart from Brahman. It must be Brahman alone which is appearing as the world. So, Brahman is not a second, there is not a second thing apart from Brahman and therefore Brahman is non-dual. How do you know there is not a second thing apart from Brahman? Because there is no cause and effect. Brahman did not produce anything, so there is no effect. And Brahman if it has not produced anything, you can't call Brahman a cause. If something produces an effect, don't, then only you call it a cause, right? So there is, Brahman is not really a cause and it has produced no effect in spite of appearing as this entire universe, what we are exper experiencing. So it must be that same primal Brahman itself, non-dual, right, non-dual, right here, right now. So this was the central teaching. Now, the subject has changed to, he says, notice our real problem is with the mind. So how to, make, how to spiritualize the mind? He has introduced the term Amani Bhava, no mind. And that's what we are discussing from verse number 31 to verse number 39. So what we will discuss 
is the, this subject of spiritualizing the mind. See, the terms which are used are, are disturbing. No mind. Uh, Amani Bhava. Vidyaranya Swami uses the term Manonasha, destruction of the mind. No mind, destruction of the mind. It can immediately create a, some, it's, it's some state where no mind is not functioning, a mindless state. Uh, um, no, we discussed it last time. What was the thing that we said? The mind is spiritualization of the mind. Spiritualization of the mind, a trouble-free mind, a, a, not a samsadi mind. That's what necessary. We, we said the mind should not be destroyed, uh, cannot be destroyed, need not be destroyed. Why should not be destroyed? Because it is only with this mind that you enjoy Jivan Mukti, the liberation while living. It's only with this mind that the teacher teaches. A teacher cannot be a mindless teacher. So every activity that the master, uh, the enlightened person does in this world is with the help of this mind. So mind should not be destroyed. Mind cannot be destroyed. And we talked about it how life after life, bodies have come and gone. The mind can't, by my mind we mean the subtle body here. Mana, buddhi, chitta, hankara, or subtle body. We have gone from lifetime to lifetime. So even death cannot destroy the mind. And even enlightenment cannot destroy the mind. What will happen ultimately is after the death of this particular body, the subtle body also dissolves for an enlightened person. Uh, but for the unenlightened, that mind goes on. So in any case, right now, after enlightenment, the mind cannot be destroyed. It still will be there. Just as the body continues, the mind also continues. The body-mind will continue as an appearance, but it will continue. The structure will still be there. It will function. It will fulfill its, its uh, duties. And the mind so should not be destroyed, need not be uh, cannot be destroyed and need not be destroyed. You see, what is this whole business about destroying the mind or erasing the mind? It is that we feel the mind is the problem. And it is the problem. It is the mind which generates duality. And we have understood in, in uh, Mandukya, samsara is seen as dvaita, duality. And so whenever the mind is functioning, it generates duality. But what is understood is that the spiritualization of the mind means Seeing the non-duality here itself. If you have a mind which is enlightened, which actually sees non-duality, sees means experiences it, knows the reality of non-duality and the falsity of duality, then that mind can, be, can live right here and yet not be affected by samsara. The mind of a jivan mukta, of an enlightened person, that, that need not be destroyed. Why should it be destroyed? So should not be, cannot be, need not be destroyed. So what should be done with it? Spiritualize it. And in Advaita Vedanta it is spiritualized by knowledge. What knowledge? Knowledge of, um, we studied, Atma Satyanu Bodhena. One of the verses was, the knowledge of the reality of the Atman. What is the reality of the Atman? Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jiva Brahmi Vanapara. Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance, and I am none other than Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. So this is called Atma Satya Anubodhena. Settle down there, yeah. Atma Satya Anubodhena means by realizing the, the truth. That my Atman, that is Satchidananda, that, that is who I am. Not the body, not the mind. I am that non-dual Atman. Or in the language of the Mandukya, I am not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper, but I am the fourth, the Turiya. So that realization, that realization sets you free. That makes the mind spiritualized. That makes the mind no mind. That realization itself is called destruction of the mind. So far, we have seen this. Now the question arises. A subtle question is um, this, this verse which has come right now. It is actually an answer to a very subtle question, an important question. This, you are saying, there is only one non-dual Brahman. Who realizes this knowledge and how? 
I am Brahman, this knowledge. You said this knowledge itself is the spiritualization of the mind. The mind becomes no mind when you realize Aham Brahmasmi. In the mind itself the knowledge comes, Aham Brahmasmi. But didn't you just say the world is not a real world, it's an appearance. Which means the mind also is falsified, it's an appearance. Then a false mind gets this knowledge about the Absolute. And how? Because this Absolute is beyond the mind. How will the mind get the knowledge about the Absolute? Who gets the knowledge? How does this happen? You seem to be contradicting yourself. What is, uh, realize, what is, what is meant by falsity, realizing the falsity of the world in the Advaita Vedanta? Um, na apratiti badha. Apratiti means not. Apratiti means non-perception. So it's not non-perception. In Advaita Vedanta, it's not that when you realize the falsity of the world, it does not mean the world will disappear in a puff of smoke. It does not mean the body will disappear in a puff of smoke. It doesn't mean that the mind will shut down forever, and some kind of mysterious burst of light will be there, something like that. Today they re uh, released the first picture of the big ba uh, of the ba black hole. First time they have an image. So something like that will happen. No, 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 exactly like this. What you are seeing, the enlightened person also sees. What you hear, the enlightened person also hears. Everything is like this. Hold on. Everything is like this. But what happens? What's the difference? What's the difference? Mithyatva nishchaya. Mithyatva nishchaya means uh, the, the, the um, insight into the appearance nature, the falsity of all of this. So you look at the blue sky and seeing the blue sky, you <coughs> assert it's not blue. Looking at the blue sky, knowing full well it's not blue, you can still say sky is so blue today. You know. And people also know what you mean. People know that you are not saying it as a matter of fact. You are talking about how it appears and how beautiful it is. Knowing full well that the sun does not rise in the east and does not set in the west. You say, come see the sunset today, there. It's so beautiful. People are coming to take pictures, to seeing the sun setting. You can see that thing happening. Knowing at the same time, it's not happening. In the same way, the enlightened person knows that the whole thing is an appearance in consciousness and yet can do everything. You can go, go drive to the job and uh, you can uh, um, carry on the business of life, of science, of religion. Everything can continue. Knowing full well the, the reality underneath is not a multiplicity. It's one Brahman which you are. So this is what is meant by falsity of the world. This is what is meant by falsity of the world. Not erasing the world. Okay, that may be so. But if the mind is not real, then how do you get this knowledge? If you are Brahman, you are not an individual jiva, the, the sentient being, then who gets this knowledge? So this is the question. So the answer to this question is um, this verse. Very grand, very powerful verse. This is one of those verses where I say, if you get what they are trying to say, you are just one step away from enlightenment. It's that powerful. You can see the the extraordinariness of Gaudapada in this verse. What does he want to say? Look at it this way. Knowledge comes. Look at it this way. The question is, how do I get God? General, let's take the step back and general question in spiritual life. How do I attain um, in Hindi? Paramatma ki prapti kaisi hogi? Let me put two questions to you. One question is, by what practices shall I get God? Shall I realize God? By what practices shall I realize God? People ask, how shall I become enlightened? By that, what do they mean? What they generally mean is, tell me some practices. What should I eat? What should I wear? How should I sit? Um, how should I breathe? What should I visualize? How many hours a day should I sit like that? What practices, by what practi practices can I get God? Come on, come on, come on in. By what practices can I get God? That is question number one. Settle down, yeah. Come. By what practices can I get God? That, that is generally what people mean when they ask, how do I realize God? 
And let me ask another question. That which is ever present, that which is ever present, right now, it's present. That which is here itself, everywhere and here, all the time and right now, and not different from me, my own reality. By how can I know that? By what practices will I attain God? Question one. But that God which you are speaking of, which is everywhere and here, all the time and now, and nothing but my own real self. There is no question of attainment. It is that, right now. So the only thing is to be done is to know it. So you can ask, how do I know it? By what means will I know it? If you understand the difference between these two questions, you will understand Vedanta. If you do not understand the difference between these two questions, it's a wasted effort. Think about what I asked. Pay attention. It's because people do not understand the difference between these questions. After all Vedanta classes, they will ask, yeah, but tell us something practical. <laughs> I have never, from my childhood, never had this question. When I listen to Advaita Vedanta, I never have this question. It seems to be the most practical thing. It's like you are in a dream and suffering terribly and somebody tells you to wake up. And then you say, I don't know, that sounds terribly theoretical. Tell me something practical. How do I meditate? How do I pray? What exercises do I do? What foods do I eat to relieve myself from my suffering? That seems practical to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry, today it's one of those days where I feel very discouraged. I've been reading and studying and trying to spiritualize my mind and I read about Sri Ramakrishna's life and Yogananda and all these great sages and gurus. And then I come to a sentence where and then towards the end of their life they reach self-realization. I thought, oh my God, if it took them that long, it's going to take me like a million years. What chances do I stand? <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah. So the answer to your question is uh, right here today. All your discouragement will vanish in an instant if you pay attention and understand. Just understand at the end of this class what, what, what they are trying to say. But they all seem to have their guru every day who is teaching them, guiding them. I managed to come to Manduka class once a week. How is that ever going to be enough? And again, I am telling you, it will not be enough if you go on the way you are going on. It will be enough if you pay attention. This is the second time I am telling you. I told you already you did not listen. Notice how I listen to your questions and I can repeat your questions back to you. You don't listen to what I say. If you would, all your problems would be solved. Right here today when you walk out of it, your problems would be solved. Forever. But you don't listen. Most of you won't. All right, so you'll have to uh, do lots of exercises in your dreams. You will not listen to the waking up advice. <laughs> have it your way. Few lifetimes. <laughs> if that's what you consider funny, then do it. But if you would rather not, if you want us really want a solution, if that's a real question, then you will pay attention. Direct answer to your question is right here. Just now I asked you the two questions. We could spend the whole class on this, these two questions. One question is, tell me by what practices I will attain enlightenment, God realization, I will see God, I will become free, I will wake up. What practices? This is question number one. That's, you, that's what you are asking. Yes, you are. Think about it. They had guidance of gurus and they took so long. What takes long? Practice takes long. Now I want an acknowledgement for you. Practice takes time? Yeah. Yes. Practice takes time. Guidance of the guru. Yeah. So practice takes time. Lifetimes. And here I am getting only one Mandukya class a week. So your mentality still is the practice mentality. It's the practice paradigm you're talking about. I need to put in more hours. And Swami, you need to give me more hours. 
Why? Because it's practice. Practice takes time, effort, repetition. That's question one. Now contrast it with another question I'm putting to you. Pay attention. If it is true that this, what you're talking about, Brahman, is all the time eternal, so it must be now, here, right now. 4.15 p.m. today. It must be there right now. And if it is everywhere, then it must be right here. And if it is my own real self, that's what the Upanishad continuously tells me, I am that. Then it is right now, right here, it's me. The only problem is I don't see it, I don't feel it, I don't know it. How can I know it? That's the question. Do you understand the question? Not how can I attain it. What is attainment? Moving through space from here to there, I will attain. I need a car, a subway, yeah, or uh, 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 something, a, a, a heavenly chariot to take me to the higher worlds. Going there, that is attainment. Another type of attainment is time. I must wait until death, after death, after the coming of the incarnation, after Sri Ramakrishna comes again, after Jesus comes again, after I get certain experiences, after, after, time, that also takes attainment. That you also have to wait for that. Or some other object, I am this, and there's something called Brahman, which I must get hold of. I am not, get, Swami, that's too crude, not get hold of, in the sense, I must merge myself into it. 20% Brahman, 40%, 50%, and then 100%, done. This is called attainment. It's deep within us. The real problems are not in Advaita, the real problems are in the enormous complexities we have set up. That's why these questions come. Okay, so... It is not a question of attainment. Be careful with words. You are saying it's a question of realization. And you will be back again. You say it's a question of realization. Now what do I have to do to get that realization? <laughs> how much time and how much effort and how much practice do? No, you are back again to that. Realization should be instantaneous. If it is here, now and you, it should be instantaneous. So... So the question here, which is being asked here, is not a question about practice. Not a question about how many hours you put in. And Americans, you Americans make it worse. By impatience, especially Manhattans. So that old Zen story about, I'm sure it must have been an American student who goes to a Japanese Zen master and says, how long um, do I have to practice to get enlightenment? Zen, Satori, how many hours a day? And So he says... Um, for um, 10 years, it will take you 10 years. 10 years, I don't have that much time. Uh, if I practice twice, twice, how long will it take me? Is it 40 years. <laughs> no, no, no. Practice has its role. What is practice? Karma, Upasana, Yoga. What do they do? They give their practices and they have results. What we are talking about here is not a practice. And it doesn't have a result also. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. Practices have results. Karma. When you make it into karma yoga, transform your actions into spiritual action, it purifies the mind. It removes vasana, it removes the conditionings of the mind, purifies the mind, prepares the mind. Yoga, meditation, it focuses the mind, removes distractions. We don't know how distracted we are. You try meditation, you'll realize how distracted you are. And then the upasana, which is the devotion, bhakti, that channels your emotions, sublimates the emotions. I want, I love, I desire the world. The world is replaced by I want, I love, I desire God. All of these are meant to prepare the mind. They are not meant for, uh, they will not give you God realization. They will not give you this, this Brahma Jnana. 
They are all necessary. They will give you certain results. Remember, today I am talking entirely from the framework of Gaudapada. No compromise. With that prepared mind, when you approach this, that knowledge will give me realization of who or what I am. Right here, right now, I am this. So for realization, for knowledge, what is required? The Sanskrit words are very precise. Pramana. Practice for preparing the mind. In Sanskrit, abhyasa. But for getting knowledge, which is what we are trying to do, what is required is pramana. Pramana means source of knowledge. Pramana. So now the question in Vedanta becomes, by what pramana will I get this knowledge? That I am Brahman. Up to this, if your understanding has been sharpened, then the progress will be much faster. What, is the, what should be the understanding at this point? I am Brahman. Right now. Not after Samadhi, after death, after uh, uh, initiation, after uh, going to heaven. Right here. Not in heaven, in Vaikuntha, in, in uh, paradise. No, no. Right here. Right here, right now, I am Brahman. But somehow I don't realize it, I don't feel it, I don't get it. So the point is to realize it, feel it or get it. And that realization, feeling or getting is not a practice. It is this, pramana. So the question now boils down to, by what pramana will I realize it, feel it, get it? Remember, pramana is not a practice. Pramana is knowledge. It's as simple as, how will I know that know this pen? Open your eyes and look at it. It's not a practice. Your eyes are the pramana which will show you this pen in my hand. Similarly, what pramana will show me that I am Brahman? Remember the connection. Because um, why do I need to know I am Brahman? Atma Satyanubodhena. By the realization of my own Brahman nature, mind becomes no mind. That's what we are trying to do here. Now, why should I make mind no mind? Go back to the other classes, take a look what, what we are doing. So this, what the question now boils down to what pramana? Now, how do you see this world? I see it with my eyes. My eyes are the pramana. This pen, how do you see it? So with the light, the flower, how do you see it? With the light, this board, how do you see it? If you can see it. How do you see it? With the light. So a pen, flower, board, you need the light to see it. Follow me carefully. The light, how do you see it? You have to add another light, switch on one more light. Yeah? And they put it nicely, they say in Hindi. Mashal ko dekhne ke liye dusra mashal jalaoge. To see a flaming torch in your hand. Do you have to light another flaming torch? No. You are that flaming torch. You are that light which reveals everything to you in your life right now. And that light is known by that light alone. That's what the answer is and we shall investigate that now. So these instruments reveal to us this world. Eyes reveal to you form. I see the form with the eyes. I hear sound with the ears. I feel things with my touch, skin, sense of touch. I smell the fragrance. I taste with my tongue. These are the instruments which give inst knowledge of this world. F sound, form, taste. Remember the question is now, what instrument will give me knowledge of Brahman? What pramana will give me knowledge of Brahman? Now let me tell you something. Actually you do not... See with the eyes. You really do not see with the eyes. When you, when you fall asleep, when you fall asleep, eyes are closed. How do you see? By seeing, I mean the experience of seeing. Right now you're getting an experience of seeing. There was this person who went to sleep with his glasses on. Why? I want to see my dreams more clearly. <laughs> Hearing aid on. Why? Because uh, I need to. I can't hear what people are saying. So in my dreams, I need to know what people are saying. 
How ridiculous is that? But then that shows you something incredible. We have clear, distinct experiences of seeing. It feels like you're seeing. It feels like you're hearing. In your dreams. Without these physical eyes or, or the ears. Absolutely without them. They are shut down. The instrumentation, instrumentation has been shut down. And yet we have exactly similar experiences in dream. Which means the experiences are not really in the eyes. The eyes are not seeing. The ears are not hearing. It's in the mind. So the mind gets the experience. When you see a pen, there is a pen, akar avritti. Avritti means a movement of the mind in the form of the pen, in your mind. When you hear a piece of music, there is a music, akar avritti, in your mind. That's what gives you the experience. Somebody told me a few, a few weeks ago that um, expert musicians, they say that they actually hear the music in their mind. They can look at the scales, you know, classical Juilliard school, they can look at the scales and they hear it. When they're reading it, they, they hear it. Beethoven. Beethoven's the classic example, the great composer who went slowly deaf and the music improved. <laughs> I don't know if it did, I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but, huh? blind, deaf, deaf, deaf. Deaf is most important because he can't hear it. And he's composing this extraordinarily subtle and powerful music. It's in the mind. All our five senses are functioning beautifully in the mind. Hmm? So music got more complicated, actually. He wrote an incredible... More, more complicated, yeah? yeah. So it's in the mind. Our perceptions, not ears, not eyes, not um, uh, uh, tongue or, or uh, nose. It's in the mind. Those are there, of course, but in the mind. Experience takes place in the mind. So mind is the source of this knowledge. Whether here or in dreams. And yet I will say to you one more thing. Even mind is not the source of knowledge. When the mind shuts down, deep sleep. How do you know deep sleep? Don't say that I don't know deep sleep. Because you all, all of us share the experience of a third state apart from waking and dreaming. A state of blankness, of deep rest. We have this in our culture, in all cultures across the world. So there must be some experience. By what do you know deep sleep? By what are you aware of deep sleep? I'm, I'm saying you in a very general sense. I'm not saying you the person. Because you the person is shut down there in deep sleep. By what? Notice one thing. Objects keep changing. Here is a pen. You're seeing it. <coughs> by one, the light, same light. There is a flower. You're seeing it by the same light. There is a picture. The same light. You're seeing it. There is a board. The same light. You're seeing it. Pen, flower, picture, board. Coming and going. Light? Do they arrive with their own light and depart with their own light? No, no, no. So the light is constant. Similarly, the light of consciousness is constant. And the knowledge we have, that comes and goes. Pen, pen knowledge, gone. Flower, flower knowledge, gone. Board, board knowledge, gone. Picture, picture knowledge, gone. But the knowledge, look at that. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. What is common to all these knowledges? Awareness or consciousness. And when all this knowledge shuts down, when you go to sleep, and you have a real world of your dreams, that awareness continues, in which you have various kinds of knowledge. Mind is generating your dreams. When mind shuts down again, in deep sleep, mind is shut down, awareness continues. What happens then? The inactivity, the absence of the mind and sensory inputs, that is revealed by awareness. A blankness, an absence is revealed by awareness. That's what, that, why I say deep sleep, sushupti is not an absence of experience. It's an experience of absence. It's an experience of absence. Now, I'm telling you something. In the sadhus in Uttarakhand, they say, Lo bam gola. That means, I'm throwing, I'm going to throw a bomb. <laughs> Swami uh, Ranganath Anandaji, the 13th president of our order, he used to say, Vedantic thought bombs. Vedantic. <laughs> Nowadays, Post 9-11, you can't use such language, especially in airports. You will be arrested immediately by the TSA. But Vedantic thought bombs means, here is a stunning revelation. 
by what is deep sleep experienced. That undoubtedly you experience deep sleep. Now here is the, what is the then the thought bomb? What is the, <laughs> it is this. That which experiences, which it reveals to you all forms with the help of eyes, all sounds with the help of ears, all tastes and touch and everything, fragrance, everything. That which reveals to you the varied experiences of your dreams with the help of the mind. That which reveals to you the absence of all these um, activities, senses, mind, all of that in deep sleep. Which reveals to you the, the, that, absence, that, that absence of mental activity in deep sleep. Which reveals sushupti to you, deep sleep to you. That one. That one reveals sushupti to you by what? By eyes. Are you seeing, seeing sushupti deep sleep by eyes? Are you hearing deep sleep? No. Smelling, tasting, touching? Are you thinking about deep sleep? No. Are you saying with your buddhi, your intellect, I am now in deep sleep? If you say that, you are not in deep sleep. <laughs> no. None of the so-called instruments, the pramanas, none of them are present there. None of them are present there. They say pramana, prameya, vyavahara, vilakshana. Beyond the activities of the sources of knowledge and the objects known to them. The absence of all of this in deep sleep. In deep sleep that's not there. The absence of all of them is revealed to you directly. You the consciousness shines upon that. That which knows the absence of all pramanas also. What pramana is needed to know that? It reveals everything to you, like the light. Then what do you need to see it? Nothing. It itself is sufficient to reveal itself. That which reveals sushupti to you, sushupti sakshi, you are the witness of your own deep sleep. That witness of deep sleep does not require anything else to reveal itself. It is self-revealed, self-shining like this, this, uh, this light. Now see, why we, have, we, have a, we look quizzical about what's going on. Why we have this confusion. We have this confusion here because of this. We have this confusion because um, we feel differentiated. Our general idea about ourselves is this person we are in the waking state. But in the waking state, Consciousness has already been laid over, overlay, you talk about overlays in computers. There is an overlay of mind, intellect, mind, memory, personality. There is an overlay of sensory activities. Then there is an overlay of the body. And there is an overlay of a social personality. And that is what you regard yourself as. From that perspective, the witness of deep sleep does not seem to be a very clear concept. Here, what do we think? We are all different from each other. Men, women. Come, come, come. We are all different from each other. Men, women, good, bad, nice. Yeah. All these differentiations. We are separate people, separate personalities, separate life stories. All at this level of, of body-mind complexes. That there is one consciousness... Undifferentiated. That seems so alien to our way of thinking. But just think about it. That, imagine the deep sleep. Nothing is there. World is not experienced. Body is not experienced. You neither see, nor hear, nor smell, nor taste, nor touch. You do not think. You do not try to understand. You do not feel you are a doer. That witness of Sushupti. Sushupti Sakshi. That witness, is that a good witness or a bad witness? Good or bad? Dharmatma, papatma. Is it very sinful? Is it very virtuous? Is it a man or a woman? Gendered boy or girl? I was reading because 
Uh, here, we, the most complex gender situation is in New York City. So, uh, New York State. We have legally 31 genders. You did not know that. You don't, you don't have to believe me. You can Google it. 31, legally 31 genders. Uh, and I was seeing that. Now there's a movement. Babies, you cannot call them babies any, anymore. They have to call them babies. <laughs> yes. If babies are boys or girls. That, that's the wrong thing to say. to. Well, who are you to tell the babies whether they are boys or girls? <laughs> so they will be called babies. And what organs they are born with will be kept confidential among a few caregivers until they are old enough, let's say three or four years, when they can decide whether they want to be one of the 31 genders. A whole menu will be given to them. So, that Sakshi, the, wit the witness consciousness in deep sleep, is it a boy or a girl? Yes, not is it a Devi? Yes. <laughs> not Devi, a Devi. <laughs> no, it is not. That witness consciousness, is it happy or sad? Yeah. Neither. Happy or sad is in the mind. Happy or sad is in the mind. Good or bad is the person with, with, uh, who has done a lot of punya or papa. It's neither punyatma nor papa. Punya means one with a lot of merits. Papa means a lot of sins. No, that consciousness is none of them. Is it um, located in time and space? Is it here and not there? No. Don't say it's in the bed, lying there and sleeping. <laughs> From its own perspective, no world, so forget the bed. So it's not in a particular space. Is it located in time? It's now 2 a.m. After a little while, the alarm clock will ring. So to whether to press snooze or not to press snooze is the question. Now, is it like that? No, no sense of time. Time and space are recognized only when the mind starts functioning. Before that, the consciousness which, which sees the absence of the functioning of the mind. There is no question of time or space there. Is it different in different bodies and minds? No. Think about it. Our notion is to say each of us has a separate pure consciousness. Do we have separate pure consciousness? No. The separation is because if you say separate pure consciousness, I will say what distinguishes one pure consciousness from another? What distinguishes one, one witness from another? You might say, I am witnessing this hall, my friend is witnessing Central Park, so the two witnesses are different, because they, they are witnessing different things. But in deep sleep, all of us witness the same thing. True or not? Does anybody have a better deep sleep than the other person? A more exciting deep sleep? A more boring deep sleep? A more educated PhD deep sleep? An affluent deep sleep and a homeless deep sleep? No. There is no difference in, in experience. And in the experiencer, it's only awareness. How will you say we have different consciousnesses? So, that witness consciousness of deep sleep, let me just put it all together, what we have got, is beyond all distinctions of gender. It's beyond all distinctions of body. It's beyond time and space. From its own perspective. It is um, beyond all functionings of the mind. Uh, happy, sad, uh, desirous, peaceful, disturbed, beyond. Even the most mentally disturbed person in deep sleep. That's why they give medicines and all of that. <coughs> deep sleep, nothing. Gone. That witness consciousness is not mentally disturbed. Perfectly alright. So it's beyond all of that. It's beyond all limitation. Uh, millions of people, millions of witness consciousnesses? No, it is one witness consciousness. And that which reveals the darkness of deep sleep, is it not aware of itself? Can it not reveal itself? Of course, if it is revealing that, it can reveal itself. What we do, one, one, when we wake up, the problem is this, when we wake up, we have this overlay of mind and senses and our personal story and body. And in this waking world, I am this person with so many of my problems. This is who I am. That sense of limitlessness and oneness is lost here. But it, Vedanta is saying, it's here right now, you are still that. 
and this misconceptions which we have put upon ourselves i am this limited body mind with a limited story this is removed by vedanta what is vedanta doing vedanta is telling you this i am not the physical body i am the witness of the physical body i am not the pranic body i am the witness of the pranic body i am not the mental body i am the witness of panchakosha i am the witness of the mental body i am not even the intellect which i am using to do all this the thinking i am not even that i am not the blissful anandamaya the bliss sheet of the last one the fifth one i am the consciousness apart from all of it the witness consciousness i that witness of deep sleep that unborn consciousness godapada calls it unborn consciousness ajam it is not created by anything else i never actually enter into the intellect sheet and say i am the thinker i am the knower no no i am just pure consciousness i do not become the knower though knowing happens because of me i do not get associated with anandamaya kosha and enjoy bliss i am the enjoyer of bliss no but that happens because of me i do not descend into the mind and with the, all the desires of the mind i say i want i want no i do not descend into the prana and associate with the prana and say i am the doer kriya shakti in prana no i do not descend into the body and say that i am a man woman a devi or something like that no i am always that unborn consciousness that unborn consciousness which is the witness of the five sheets follow this that unborn consciousness which is the witness of the five sheets and the unborn consciousness which is the witness of the five elements and the universe produced by the five elements is one and the same unborn consciousness yep. okay. who is the witness consciousness of the five sheets you who is the witness consciousness of the five elements ishwara bhagavan brahman with the five elements don't look confused what are the five elements sky and fire and just the things by which the universe is made a modern scientist would say 150 80 elements of the periodic table but that witness consciousness with the power of maya which projects this entire universe i'm just translating from the hindi you know <laughs> the witness of the five elements witness consciousness of the five elements and the universe and the witness consciousness in those five sheets it's one and the same witness consciousness aham brahmasmi i am brahman yes you said um it's a matter of being here and now right here hmm. and that feels like it's right on the tip of something yes when you say neither one of them exists neither one of whom exist here and now they don't exist but that's where we should be to experience that Mhm. Here and now exist in you. It's right there. Here and now exists in you. You are here, right? You you doubtful whether you are here or not? Yes. Because I the, listen to you. Yes, you are. <laughs> so, no that's right. You are no follow this carefully. You are listening to me. You can you cannot doubt it. That which is listening to me when there is a dream and you fall asleep and you're not listening to me anymore, which can happen in this class very often. <laughs> that one is there in the dream too yes and when the dream sees and you become peaceful deep sleep that one is there still there yes you follow what i'm saying the deep sleep comes and goes that one is still there mm-hmm. you this presence is this one right now you're the presence which you're feeling that you're feeling on the edge that that presence right now that one is there when the deep sleep comes and goes whole world disappears then when the world comes back in the form of dreams that one is still there by its light the dreams are lit up and when the waking world comes back that one is still there by that light this waking world is lit up that light that you are that light you are that's what i'm saying what is happening to us is we that light which we are we trap it in this cage of body and mind trap it means we think i am this it's a passing show which is flowing past on the screen of the movie then i say i am that one in the movie and when that one undergoes trials and then the, the you know sufferings i weep with it and when that one is disappearing i am gone 
No. You, the light, are the witness of that one. The coming and going of that one. It, the ups and downs of that one. But you are there. <coughs> and you are not affected by it. That's what I'm saying. All of this samsara is due to your presence. You are not trapped in samsara. Rather, samsara is trapped in you. Samsara is your en engagement, is your uh, pastime. And you are free of samsara right now. But not as a body. Not as a mind. As the witness, as the light, which is the witness of deep sleep. As that one. Hold on to the questions. Let me finish this. Look at the verse. Now it's a very grand verse, very powerful. All this was background to the verse. Akalpakam. Kalpana means imagination. Akalpakam. Kalpana means imagination. What is imagination? Whatever you experience is imagination. Samsara is imagination. Body, husband, wife, children, all imagination. Why? Because you experience them. The birth and destructions of solar systems and universes. Imagination, because they are experienced. Black hole. Uh, black hole today. Imagination, because it is experienced. He calls all of them imaginations. Where? Why would you call them imagination? Why not real? Because what is real is you. These are occurring to you or they are shining in your light. They are revealed to you. The drishya, the Sanskrit words are more powerful actually. Drashta and drishya. Seer and seen. Three models. Let me put three models before you. Our usual way of thinking about it is, the seen is something different. Drishya, separate. I am the seer. The two different entities interacting. This is one way. This is a common sense, physical way of looking at it. Seen and seer are two different entities. If I go away without the book, book will remain. It doesn't depend on me. I don't depend on it. We interact it, I see it, I call myself a seer and this is seen. But is this true? He asks. If two things are separate, they should be experienceable separately. I say the pen and the book are separate. Why? Because you can see the book here without the pen, you can see the pen here without the book. So they are two different things. But suppose you cannot see one thing without the other. Then you have no uh, logical grounds of saying that that thing is different from the other one. What I mean by this is, all the objects of your dreams, whatever, the people in your dreams, the food you eat in the dreams, the places you go to the dream, in, in the dreams, those things, they do not exist apart from your seeing. If you don't see them, they have disapp they'll disappear. Gaurapada says, even in this waking state, <coughs> there is simply, literally, tautologically, it is impossible to experience anything without consciousness. Whatever experience anybody has, scientist, religious person, atheist, non-dualist, dualist, whatever experience they have had, they must have had it in consciousness. True or not? Yes. So, Second stage is, Drishya exists in Drashta. The seen exists in the seeing. Like things in a dream. What was the first one? The seen, the objects, they exist apart from you. And you see them. But now you are being said, it's being said, they exist in your seeing. And look at your experience, is it not so? Just by repeating this, one can come to enlightenment. Is it not so? Everything that you experience, not only see, Hear, smell, taste, touch, they are all in your experience. Have you ever experienced something outside your experience? L linguistically impossible. Logically impossible. Alright, third step. That which is in your experience, you the experiencing consciousness and the objects experienced in that consciousness, those objects are not separate from that consciousness. It is that conscious, they are made of that same consciousness which you are. It is that same consciousness which name and form which appears as these objects. And with a name and form called mind appears as the experiencer of the objects. You the experience of the objects with particular name and, mind, uh, name and form. And the object with a particular name and form. And remove the name and form underneath one consciousness alone. Who is that consciousness? You. Three steps. Drashta and Drishya. Seer and Seen are two different things. Step two. The seen is in, in the seer. Step three, the seen is nothing other than the seer. 
You are the entire universe you experience. You means consciousness, not body-mind. That consciousness with name and form are the mind. With further names and forms are the senses. With further names and forms are the body and the universe outside. But you are that same consciousness alone. Akalpakam. That consciousness in which all kalpana, all divisions, all varieties are realized to be only names and forms underneath one consciousness. Akalpakam. And what is that consciousness? Ajam. Unborn. It is not caused or produced by anything. Notice. Particular knowledges come and go. Pen knowledge, flower knowledge, board knowledge, light, uh, fan knowledge. It comes and goes. But consciousness behind them all? Constant. So particular instances of knowledge are born and they disappear, replaced by another one. But the background consciousness is not born, does not disappear, is constant. Throughout your waking life, throughout your dream, throughout deep sleep also, it's constant. Ajam, unborn consciousness. Ajam, akalpakam ajam, jnanam, jnanam means consciousness. This verse, Gaudapada uses the word Ajam four times. Ajam, it means unborn. In Uttarakhand, I asked once the Himal- monks in the Himalayas, what is the difference between Gaudapada and Shankaracharya? Shankaracharya is so well known. All of these commentaries are written by Shankaracharya and that the source of all our non-dualistic traditions are the commentaries of Shankara on the Upanishads and Brahma Sutra. So the answer by one of the monks, I can never forget. He said, Shankaracharya to Jagat Guru te. Shankaracharya was a world teacher. I said, yeah, that's true. And Gaudapada? Gaudapada, Gaudapada to bahut phakkad te. <laughs> now this, the word cannot be translated very easily. Phakkad in a... In, uh, it's, a, it's a slang term in Hindi, it means in the lower parts of this, uh, in the plains, it means a loafer, a vagabond, a, you know what you call a bum here. So, who is absolutely like a homeless person and, and nothing to do in the world and sort of um, a tramp, like a tramp, like a spiritual or a holy tramp. So, but in the high Himalayas, the word phakkar means a crazy man of wisdom. Is to, apparently to all, uh, uh, to all, uh, uh, you know, purposes, a person seems to be crazy, but completely enlightened. So Gaudapada was like that. Shankaracharya is the one who wrote the commentaries on all these Upanishads. Uh, is the one who established the four great monasteries on the four corners of India. The ten orders of monks of which we are a part to, and today we are standing here. Vivekananda, Sri Ramakrishna is also part of those ten orders of monks. Vivekananda also. I am too. And so Shankaracharya set Hinduism on its present course. Not only non-dual Vedanta, all the puja paddhati, the, the worship of, uh, of um, Shiva, of Durga, of, uh, of Ganesha, of Kartikeya, in the different parts of India. These were prevalent, but he systematized them and assigned different places. So he sort of reorganized Hinduism 1400 years ago. Tremendous amount of work in his 32 years. So he's a world teacher. Gaudapada, none of that. He is the crazy man of wisdom. <laughs> so the difference between, I was thinking today, Shankaracharya and Gaudapada, if you at all make a difference, Shankaracharya, if you want to look at his teachings, you will find all the processes, the sub-schools of Advaita, they all go to him. Srishti Drishti Vada, Drishti Srishti Vada. Uh, the universe has been created, God created the universe, we are in this created universe and now we are working our way towards enlightenment. That's one way of looking at it. So you can find that in Shankara's word, teachings. The other way, more advanced way, Drishti Srishti Vada, like dream. It's not that there was a dream world already created for you, now you lie down, now you enter into the dream world. You know, visa and passport and everything, now you are stamped and uh, for tonight you are in this world. No. That world pops into existence when you start dreaming. So, Drishti Srishti Vada says, this universe pops into existence when you experience it. That's, 
That's another way of looking at Advaita. Is it true? Not true. None of them are true. <laughs> Only Advaita Brahman is true. But this is another way of, of um, a ladder, which you can, a path which you can, you can take. A little more difficult. That also you can find in Shankara's teachings. Um, Avachedavada, there are different forms. Avachedavada, Pratibhimbavada, Abhasavada. What do they mean? What is the Brahman is infinite consciousness. But what are we? What are we? There are three theories in Advaita. And all of them can be justified from Shankara's point of view. What are the three theories? One is, imagine the sun out there and put a pot here and water in the pot. When you look into the pot, what will you find? A tiny little sun. So the sun is shining there and you will find a tiny little sun there. So that big sun, the real sun is Brahman. And the little sun is the sentient being, the jiva, us. What is the pot? Body. What is the water? Subtle body, mind. This is called Pratibhimbavada, the theory of reflection or the, the, the doctrine of reflection. So what are, what are we? We are reflections of the ultimate reality in body-mind. That's one, one way of looking at it. It's called Pratibhimbavada. But there's another way of looking at it. Avachedavada which is a limitation theory. We are limitations of the infinite. What do you mean limitation? When you look at out the window, not this one, a window on the higher floors, into the blue sky there, you will see four square blue skies. Four squares, four blue squares. It's not that the sky has four blue squares, it's the window frame which has four blue squares, uh, four squares. The blueness belongs to the sky, but it's an unbroken blueness. It gets broken up into four patches of blue because of that framework. Similarly, an unbroken existence consciousness bliss through time, space and causation into all these bodies, it seems to be millions of consciousnesses. No reflection here. It's that same original consciousness appears to be many. This is called avachedavada, the limitation theory. There's another one, abhasavada. That's also very interesting. It's very, very much like reflection. But in reflection, what happens is, um, there's a faint difference. The Abhasavada means, it's like um, your face seen in a mirror. The face seen in a mirror is not a real face. Um, you might say the sun reflected in the water is also not a real sun. But there in the reflect reflection theory, they will say, that sun reflected in the water is nothing other than the real sun. So it directs your attention to the real sun. Here, the Abhasavada is that uh, the reflections in the mirror are false. The jivas are false. Brahman alone is real. The, the reflection theory says the jivas are none other than Brahman. This one, Abhasavada means appearance theory. The appearances are false. Brahman alone is real. So it's a fine difference. But there are different schools of thought. They've given so much thought to how this individualization comes about. All of these you can find in Shankaracharya. But Godapada? Mm -hmm. Ajatavada. Where does Ekajiva uh, fit in this? I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, Ekajiva is, I'll come, come to that. Godapada, Ajatavada. What is Ajatavada? The unborn. Is it a reflection? No. Is it a limitation? No. Is it an appearance? It means you. Are you a reflection of the ultimate reality? Are you an appearance of the ultimate reality? Are you a limitation of the ultimate reality? Gaurapada says none. Okay. Then what is the sentient being? How is the sentient being born from the ultimate reality? He says not born at all. How is the universe created from the ultimate reality? Shankara will say through Maya and the, and the five elements are produced and this is none of that. The universe is not created. So that is Godapada, Ajata Vada. <laughs> Eka Jiva Vada is a consequence of Drishti Shrishti Vada. Eka Jiva Vada means one Jiva. Eka means one. Jiva means sentient being. One Jiva means. Right now, right here, imagine your dreams. That's a classic example. In your dream, you meet many people. Maybe you're giving a talk to, uh, I have the biggest talk I've ever given ever is 14,000 people. 
So you're sitting in, in or in your, we're watching your favorite game in, in the, what do you call the big uh, stadium? Tens of Yankees game, ten th tens of thousands of people, you're sitting there and watching it and you're having, a, surrounded by a sea of people and then suddenly you wake up. Now, tell me, when you were there watching it in the middle of 10,000 people, how many were there actually? 10,000? One. In the dream, but really, I'm asking really, from your waking perspective? One, one mind, the dreamer's mind. How many jivas were there? How many jivas were there? One. You. Though you appeared to be interacting with 10,000 people, it seemed at that time that there were 10,000 bodies and maybe 10,000 minds in those bodies and 10,000 people in those body-mind complexes, persons. But really, no, not 10,000. Only one. So in the middle of the 10,000 crowd, 9,999 were appearances. There was only one jiva, you. And you felt you were in that. That's samsara for you. And what is enlightenment? Waking up and sitting up in your bed. All those 10,000 disappear. So you realize at that time they were not 10,000. I alone was there. You were the only jiva. But in that dream you are not Brahman, you are jiva because you feel that you are in the middle of that and you are enjoying or suffering as your team is winning, you are clapping and cheering as they are doing badly, you, you are yelling at them. Uh, you are definitely in samsara, so you are definitely a jiva. But you are the only one there. And you are also Brahman because when you wake up you realize the whole thing was your projection. Now, that's a dream. Are you with me as an example, dream example? Now take it in this world. What Ekajiva Vada says a tremendous <laughs> is a tremendous assertion. How many people are here in this room? Now you're seeing one. <laughs> <laughs> Consider it from your point of view. You can look around yourself and count maybe 50 people. But really, are, are, can you see 50 people or you can see 50 bodies? You can see their behavior, their speech. But is there a person in that body? How do you know? If I were a telepath, I would know. If you were a telepath, you would know their thoughts. But is there a consciousness, a person behind those thoughts? How would you know? You wouldn't know. In fact, if you go strictly by your experience, there's only one person, you. And that's how we live life actually. The gulf between you and the person sitting next to you is much wider than the gulf between continents or stars and planets. Forever unbridgeable. You can never really reach out to the person next to you. The impossibility of actually really deeply touching a person. Body you can see. Behavior, language you can see. But the person inside completely isolated. What proof is that there is another person? This could just be another dream. But still, your problems are still there. You will say, whatever it is, I am still, I suffer and I enjoy. I don't know the meaning of life and I'll probably die. All that is there. So if that is there, then you are a jiva. You are suffering. And you need to get out of that suffering. So you are a jiva. Your samsara is still there. Only that you seem to be the only jiva here. And you need to realize your Brahman nature. It's a very lonely kind of spiritual practice. So, Eka Jeeva Vada. So, so, these are models. Eka Jeeva. They are all models. They are all paradigms. Now, I heard something yes, at the uh, Unknowability Conference, mm. which is the, uh, this Feierstein guy, Stuart Feierstein. Mm. He said, all models are wrong, mm. but some models are useful. Mm. So, my question after that became, so is, is Advaita itself a model? It or is, it, is it true? For, 40, uh, you'll see, 1400 bef years before Unknowability Conference of Manhattan, <laughs> After talking about all of this, Gaudapada will say, Advaita michanti kechana, Advaita michanti chapare. Some people like non-duality, some people like duality. But the truth actually, Dvaita Dvaita Vivarjitam Tattvam. If there is a truth, it is beyond duality and non-duality. Only thing is, in the language of that conference, Gaudapada would say, Advaita is a more useful model than the dualistic models. Useful in what sense? For waking up. For waking up. The other thing I read about uh, from Vivekananda uh, regarding today's topic is that, and, and knowing of Brahman, knowing yourself as Brahman, 
He says, as no man can jump out of his own self, huh. so no man can go beyond the limits of time and space. Huh. And further he says, you cannot by any possibility say you know him. Huh. That would be degrading him. Huh. So how does, how does that resolve with recognizing um, or attempting to recognize, you know, uh, uh, to integrate Aham Brahmasmi? How, how does that resolve? What I've been saying all along, one hour now? That's, you. <laughs> That's the exact question, That's you. which I started at the beginning with. This verse, it starts to answer this question itself. Don't you see? The question is, how can you know Brahman? <laughs> that which is the pure subject. You can know an object. If it has a form, you can see it. If it has a sound, you can hear it. Correct. You can taste it, touch it. If it's a concept, you can try to understand it. If it's some if mathematics, you can apply and you can know something mathematically. You can observe it and conduct experiments. But Brahman is, is beyond all of this. Not only this, you are going further to say that all of these instruments you are using are all appearances, are false. Then how at all will you know Brahman? That is the question exactly. What Vivekananda is saying is, if you knew Brahman by those methods, in a test tube, by, a, by a binoculars, by, by a, a telescope, microscope. You are making Brahman into an object. God known in that sense is no longer God. It's a, it's a finite thing. It's an object. Then the question would arise, who is knowing that? So this is not an object. Then how is it known? And that's what he's trying to answer here. I was not talking at random. Let me see if you, if you followed my train of thought. I'll very quickly summarize. This world, how do we know it? By knowledge. Knowledge is one or many. Knowledge keeps changing. Whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, a series of knowledge comes before you. Knowing. And knowing, I'm using, I'm using knowing in the common sense, the way it is used in day to day life or in science, for example. That way, where you read, know from a TV, um, uh, an experiment or a book. So it's a series of knowledge. But then I said, there is one consciousness running through all that knowledge, like one light revealing everything. You are the consciousness in all your knowledge. With me so far? Yes. And that consciousness actually does not depend on the instruments. You don't need to keep your glasses on and your hearing aid on when you go into dreams. You have to see clearly and hear clearly. No. It sounds funny, but it's a very important point. You can have vivid experiences of seeing and hearing in your dreams without hearing aid and without glasses. It's in the mind. So the mind continues to know in dreams. Dreams, the mind also shuts down. Consciousness itself shines on the blankness after dreams, deep sleep. Sushupti is also revealed to you. But that revelation of Sushupti, follow this, revelation of Sushupti is not like other knowing. Because there is no knower and known. Knower and known disappear there. So you're using revelation separate from knowing, from knowledge. Yeah, but it's still an experience. Because otherwise, how are we at all talking about it in every culture of the world? Huh? Sushupti, we have an intuitive feeling of, of Sushupti. To what is Sushupti revealed? If mind was the ultimate, if eyes were the ultimate seer, then the moment you close your eyes, you are not there anymore. That's false. You're still there when the eyes are closed. Because your mind, suppose the mind is shut down in Sushupti or in deep meditation. Do you know you're not there? No. The yogi doesn't say, I disappear in deep meditation. I'm very much there. I'm an enlightened yogi in, in deep meditation. Sushupti is also revealed as a blankness in... in, in uh, so to what is Sushupti revealed? My core point, that was which I said, the Vedantic thought bomb, Bamgola was this. Try to grasp this. If you are such that you are the witness of deep sleep... If deep sleep also is being revealed to you, by you, then what do you need to reveal yourself? That which can reveal deep sleep in the absence of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin. That which can reveal deep sleep in the absence of mind. That which can reveal deep sleep in the absence of intellect. That one, without any instruments, without pramanas, it reveals the deep sleep. So, so to say, therefore, that you're enlightened in deep sleep? No, no, you're not enlightened. You're not enlightened. You're in the presence of... You're, you're, the witness, the witness consciousness being revealed to you. The witness consciousness... So, so what I'm saying is... No, my point, I'll repeat it again. 
deep sleep is revealed by you, the witness consciousness. The state of deep sleep. That which can now follow, that which can reveal deep sleep. Imagine what is meant by saying revealing deep sleep. No instruments are there. No glasses and telescopes, no mind, no intellect, no sense organs, no brain, no nervous system, nothing is present to you in deep sleep. And yet you reveal the deep sleep. What is that? No, I'm not even saying that. That one which can reveal the deep sleep without any help at all. It can reveal deep sleep without any help at all. Does it, re- wait, does it require anything to reveal itself? No, it should not. Logically speaking, it should not. It does not require any help to reveal itself. Is deep sleep an object? Deep sleep is an object to that pure consciousness. The state of deep sleep is revealed as if it is another. It will, Godapada will say. It is revealed like as if you are revealing, like I am seeing a pen. There, there the witness consciousness sees, within quotes, deep sleep. Nothingness, blankness. An experience of absence, a quiescence, a, a settling down. Everything is there. It will come back again. Next he will show us the difference between deep sleep and enlightenment. He will talk about that next verse. Now this is the point which is meeting. A subtle point, a tiny point. But of, of uh, catastrophic con- <laughs> uh, implications. Which means that, and remember, that core consciousness alone. It reveals dreams when mind starts functioning. That core consciousness alone reveals your body and senses once once you wake up. And through the body and senses, it reveals a world. It is that consciousness alone which reveals everything. That shining, everything shines. By its light, everything is lit up. That thou art. Now, the problem is, hold on. The problem is, so then are we enlightened in deep sleep? No. Enlightenment is removal of ignorance. And ignorance is the one which is creating problems for us right now in the waking state. I mentioned all this. That's why I say you don't hear. It's not your fault. It's a lot to take in. In the waking state we have problems. Do you remember what I said? In the waking state we are good person, that person, uh, bad person, man, woman, child. Devis or whatever, and uh, Papatma, a sinful person or a good person, um, we are seer, hearer, smeller, taster, touch. All of this we, we put upon ourselves and we are separate, man, woman. We locate ourselves in time and space and we have individual stories associated with us and therefore we have samsara. But what Advaita is saying, what Gaudapada is saying, that core consciousness, which is, which is, there is no difference of man, woman, child there. There is no difference of good and bad there. You remember I mentioned? No happy, sad there. <coughs> no possibility of happy and sad there. No possibility of samsara there. No possibility of difference there. There is only oneness. That one, which is one and non-dual. That one which is neither happy nor sad. That one which is not limited in time and space. That one which is neither man, woman, child, nothing. That one is still there right now and that's what you are right now. Our problem is we have completely, we don't know that right now. What we know, we take ourselves to be that. This is called adhyas or superimposition. This is what is going on. Quickly two questions that, uh, and then I'll come to you. Yes. If, if, well, I understand what you're trying to partially close their case because eyes and ears are not working, both in this if they are blind. But their super mind is working very well to create par- paradise lost and we can need this. A, a very good example. A very good example. Yeah. Wait. A very good example. 
a person cannot see and yet he composes a magnificent poem like epic poem like that so when a person cannot see is the person gone no. are persons who are blind visually challenged are they non existent no. it's ridiculous don't even say, think of such a thing yeah. a person who are deaf have they disappeared yeah. of course not how silly you are very much there you are exactly the same it's just that the instruments are malfunctioning now now imagine a person with all the senses shut down you don't have to imagine we all experience that every day oh. all senses shut down are you there or not yes. all senses plus mind and intellect shut down are you there or not ha mm-hmm. oh. question so we need to understand the statement that it repeat that you repeat yourself oh. by yourself would it be right to think along these lines that we have in a sense shrouded ourselves with layers of illusions and delusions etc right and really once those illusions delusions we start throwing them correct let me just stop you there that is enlightenment our whole thing in uh, in ignorance is that we have identified ourselves with this body mind complex and that's why we lose sight of what we always have in what we have in deep sleep in dream state in waking state we still have it we have lost sight of it enlightenment is this process this vedanta is guiding us back to see those complications the cobweb which we have spun around ourselves we are slowly disentangling ourselves from that to discover that core reality about ourselves which is always is was and will be free but that has to be done in the waking state because the ignorance functions in the waking state the entanglement functions in the waking state but once you have done it in the waking state once you have noticed it you realize your freedom so what vedanta does it does not make you brahman it does not transform you into brahman it does not take you to brahman not uber spiritual uber no it just removes the misconception that you are not brahman doesn't even make you re- it cannot make you realize brahman why because brahman is revealed by itself see how can is it the question how can you know it you cannot know it vedanta will not make you know brahman brahman knows brahman or here in the in this language the unborn unborn knows itself by the unborn ha ah, that is what that is what is happening it's still there but on top of that we have put a layer of misconceptions those misconceptions are removed by vedanta you will say yes how can i be the body i am the consciousness which is aware of the body step 1 the body is in my awareness step 2 the body is nothing but awareness step 3 awareness only and that becomes a realization here and now and you are set free by this realization there is really no problem this problem which we have set up that is disentangled by vedanta i hear your words but yeah this is far as it goes in the world right doesn't matter don't uh, uh, become enlightened right away because we we'll lose students <laughs> we we'll lose students we there, there is more to come don't worry there's a hope there why should it bother if it is not born unborn thing you don't have to think right you don't have to think but because you are suffering that's why you have to bother if you say that i have no problem at all no vedanta for you you're perfectly all right good for you we'll say great go on <laughs> but i have a problem Yes. This is Swami I had no problem you created the problem by all of this. <laughs> no. You have a bigger problem. You come with a you saying that I am unhappy I am dissatisfied I don't understand what's going on. Then this so called problem I've created body mind identification samsara it's just a framework a paradigm to understand our problems. And it's all going to be knocked away to see that it is not not there at all. So the unborn knows itself by the unborn. Very beautiful verse. very stark and powerful language swami vivekananda this question how to know it and he says ajena ajam vibuddhyate ajam ajena ajam vibuddhyate the unborn knows itself by the unborn by what pramana does it know by the eyes ears nose does it know by mind intellect mathematics religion belief science none of them how do you know it can some something can know without any of them 
witness of deep sleep. It is revealed to itself without the help of any of these. Then, right now is it done? Is it finished? Yes, always was. Then our, what is our task? What's remaining? Why am I unsatisfied? The unsat- dissatisfaction has to be removed. That is why we have to be educated about the nature of this thing. To show that we, have, we have really have no problem there at all. Let me finish. So the unborn, who knows? The unborn consciousness itself knows. What does it know? It knows the unborn itself. By what? By what do you know deep sleep? Tell me. That's why I was harping again and again deep sleep. Tell me why, what do you know deep sleep? If you know the answer to that, you know by what you will know yourself. Uh, by, by the unborn consciousness. Unborn means, it was, unborn means non-dual. Why? What do you mean unborn? It never created an effect. So it was never born. If it did not create an effect, then it is not a cause. If it is other than cause and effect, it must be non-dual, advaitam. So the advaitam, the non-dual knows the non-dual by the non-dual. Or the unborn knows the unborn by the unborn. Pure consciousness knows pure consciousness by pure consciousness. So therefore it knows will be within court. Already when you go to deep sleep, there also knowing is already within quotes. It's not really a knowing in this sense. Alright. Um, just a humorous note and I'll take one or two questions and we'll end. I thought I would do the next two verses. The next two verses are to deal, deal with deep sleep. Because I use the deep sleep example. So they'll say, oh, so it's, is it something like deep sleep falling asleep? No. It's very, very different. But how is it different? That will be taken up in the next two verses. Anyway, just a little humorous thing. Ajam, the word ajam, if you actually look up the Sanskrit dictionary, it means a goat. <laughs> the Sanskrit word for goat is aja. So if you literally translate this with the help of, of uh, the, the dictionary, you will get, so what is enlightenment? It is the goat knowing the goat by the goat. <laughs> no. Ajam means unborn. Ja means to be born. Jati, to be born. Jayate. And ajam means that which is not created or born. The causeless consciousness, which has no effect also. Good. One by one, the questions. So does the um, samsara disappear for the enlightened soul? Mm. Once, once you realize, does the sun rise in the east and does it set in the west? Really? No. no? How do you know that? It's a school. Swami is school. And then, but, but when you, don't you go to see spectacular sunrises and sunsets? You do. So it continues to appear. But that's the real word, appearance. It's not real anymore. You know, after this, now you say, I am a samsari, Swami. You are a monk, but I am a samsari. <laughs> after that, you will say, I am not a samsari. How can the unborn consciousness be a samsari? Where is samsara for? Who is samsari? The one who, who goes through <coughs> samsara. Who says, I am this person, small, miserable, a bundle of flesh and blood. I am going to my death. And probably I'll be born again because of my miserable past karma. Nothing good is going to happen to me. I have not attained these things and I, will, I hope to attain them in my future life. And there are many plenty of horrible things which I would like to avoid in my next life. And this, I would like to go to heaven and I would like to at, uh, avoid hell. This is a samsari. That witness consciousness of deep sleep. Which is the witness consciousness in dream? Which is the witness consciousness now? Which is the Turiya, the fourth? That is not samsara. Never was, never will be. All samsara is because of it. Advaita does not, we'll see next time. Advaita does not require you to fall asleep or to go into nirvikal prasamadhi. It does not require you to close your, shut your eyes. You can let the movie go on. But only the mind should know the movie is a movie. That is called Amani Bhava. Amani Bhava mean, does not mean that you have to stop watching movies. Amani bhava, no mind. No mind means the mind which is aware that the movie is a movie, it is not samsara. Yes. Uh, you have actually answered this in some QA session. Like it was about the fault line, fault line in Maya. And one of them was like when there is no mind during a deep sleep. Yes. Uh, still, when you wake up, the, the knowledge of the deep sleep comes to your mind. You have, one of the few who have listened very carefully then. I mentioned it, I, I flagged it once. Yes. So then how does that, from the consciousness comes to the mind? When mm. will, it is actually recorded in, in, in Ajnana. Vedanta Sara says, Ati Sukshma Abhi Ajnana Vritti Bhi. How do we actually, the question is, how do we actually say I was in deep sleep? How do we say that? 
and say, what's wrong? See, I go out to Central Park and come back and I say, I saw this in Central Park. How did I say it? Memory. I saw it, recorded in memory. How was it recorded? My sense organs were working. My mind was working. I was awake and therefore it was recorded. The video camera is rolling. It's recorded. But in deep sleep, you are saying we have an experience of deep sleep which we in some sense recall when we wake up. How is it recorded then? Is pure consciousness recording? No. Because pure consciousness, that is not knowing as an act. It is just shining forth. It does not do any recording. There is no trace left there. Then where is the trace left? Why do we say, I slept? I can honestly say I was awake. I can honestly say I dreamt. But how can I honestly say I slept? Because who is this I? The ego, which was shut down in deep sleep. Do you see, this is the fault line I was talking about. How, when the ego claims, I was in deep sleep. False. And if you can catch what is the lie, you have got, we got an inkling about what is beyond the ego, the pure consciousness. It is the pure consciousness which lit up deep sleep. Not the ego. The ego started functioning when the mind started functioning. And yet the ego says, I slept. It claims the experience of pure consciousness to itself. Appropriates. How? That's the question. They say, I'm going to answer the question. He's thinking, you're repeating my question, mm -hmm. stating it in nicer and nicer forms, but what is the answer? <laughs> there was a you know, the famous issue of mind, of very famous British journal of philosophy. Mind. Have you heard of that? Mind. It's called Mind. It's the leading journal of philosophy, I think, from Oxford or Cambridge. Um, so it's very old, uh, more than, so in, for its 100th issue, they had a special issue and the issue was entirely humor. It was like a serious issue of mind, all important uh, discussions on philosophy, none of them were serious, they were making fun of everything. So one of the things was how to answer deep philosophical questions for philosophy teachers. So 10 ways of answering questions, one of the ways was this. Keep praising the question. <laughs> Wonderful question. This is the question. He says, this is what I want to know. Why? <laughs> Hope, hoping that the person will, will forget. And there are many other ways also. Another way was divert. That is, that is a really important question. But to understand that, first we must un answer this question. Then ask a question which you know the answer to. And then answer it. <laughs> And what is the link between that and this? You don't need to. People will forget. <laughs> Another one is be honest and say that I really don't know. And then the warning is there. Don't use this too much because then people will think you're a good fellow but useless. <laughs> <laughs> so there were 10 ways of answering a question. And many, many uh, humorous things like, like the thing about Descartes. Uh, he went to this uh, Paris cafe and uh, the waitress asked him, uh, Monsieur Descartes, uh, more coffee? He said, I think not. Immediately disappeared. <laughs> I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> so, is, so, like that, the whole issue is really worth having, the old one. All right, I remember your question. So, back to the question. <laughs> now, the, it's a, it's a well known question in Advaita Vedanta, and the answer is that what is there in deep sleep? It's not pure consciousness alone. Pure consciousness plus the, the causal body, Karana Sharira. The causal body or the Anandamaya Kosha, Karana Sharira, is made of Sattva Rajas Tamas. And they are dynamic. So they are in perpetual motion. And they record this. But not as memory. Therefore, you don't have a specific feeling of, I was in deep sleep. <coughs> it is just a trace of an experience of blankness. That's all you have. That's why it does not feel like memory. Dream feels like memory. Waking feels like memory. Deep sleep never feels like... It feels like an intuition. Yeah. That's what. Causal body lit up by consciousness records that. Records within quotes. It's a good point to end the class on. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu